Hello, everyone. Here we are again on our journey with Jesus. Today is a very special day because Jesus is going to be born before the end of this class session. So let us start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Baba G. Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. Dearest Swamiji, thank you for the blessing of your constant presence in our lives. Divine Mother, help us to feel close to you, to see your hand in everything that comes and to feel your joy in all that we do. Dearest Jesus, let the example of your courageous, God-centered life fill each of us with courage and clarity, that we may follow the appointed path that God has given us with the same total dedication, perfect surrender, and perfect joy that you exemplified. We are your children. Guide us and bless us in everything we do. Om. Peace. Amen. So my friends, let's start with the song. The first song we're going to have tonight is the whole story of the birth of Jesus. Because, as I said, tonight we're going to go through the actual birth time of Christ. So we're going to have Swami's beautiful Christmas song, Christmas Mystery. And as we listen to that, we'll hear the whole saga of the coming of Christ. Long ago there was a little shed that three mighty kings did bow their heads to a gentle babe of Tell to me 
My dear friends, we are tonight going to go through the birth of Jesus, but we have to start with the birth of John the Baptist. You remember when, of course, just a week ago when we were talking about how Zechariah was also visited by an angel and told that his wife Elizabeth would give birth to a child and that child would come, the Bible calls it, in the spirit of Elijah. Um, but w what Master said later was that John the Baptist, and what Jesus said later, was that John the Baptist was Elijah himself, because the entire tradition of the Jewish people was that the Messiah was coming, and that it was it would be Elijah would come and announce the coming of the Messiah. So Elizabeth conceived her child um, a three about three months before. Uh, Mary did. And then they came together, and as you remember the beautiful story of when Mary arrives, Elizabeth feels the baby in her womb leaps for joy because the baby in her womb recognizes the Messiah coming. And these two great souls were Elijah and Elisha, two great um, avatars, really, described in the Old Testament. And we, we saw the place where Mary and Elizabeth met was the home of Elizabeth in Ein Karam. And then we go now to that, we'll go back to that same city where John was born. And here's the passages from the Bible about his, his birth. And I think I've mentioned to you that the, the gospel that I read of is a combination of all four. So everything that's written about Jesus in the New, about John the Baptist in the New Testament is included in what I'm reading now. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. That phrase, great mercy, because Elizabeth was barren, which was a, a great shame in the culture there. And so not only did she have a child at this late stage of her life, but the child being a son is considered a special, especially auspicious because of the society they lived in. Although among the Essenes, men and women were equal. And Elizabeth was an Essene, but nonetheless, this is how the New Testament writes it. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. Now you may remember that when, when the angel appeared to Zechariah when he was inside the Holy of the Holies in the temple, um, he, he was afraid and he wasn't sure. And because of that, he was struck dumb. 
and he wasn't going to be allowed to speak until after John was born. So Zechariah still hasn't spoken, even up to this eighth day, apparently. So she said, but, and then they said to Elizabeth, but there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father, Zechariah, to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment he wrote, his name is John, because the angel had told Zechariah that was the name of this boy. His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Now, now of course, throughout this whole culture of the Jewish people, they're all, they all know that God is going to send the Messiah. And within the subculture of the Essene communities, which would have been the group that Elizabeth especially was, was tied to, um, here's this miraculous angelic birth happening, and they're all waiting for Elijah to come so that the Messiah will come. So the natural question is, where does this fit? Who is this person? So right from the start, there's this great expectation and excitement about this child. Because Elizabeth having a child at all was miraculous. Zachariah being visited by an angel and then struck dumb. I mean, think how how marvelous all of this is. So then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. And this is, uh, their lineage also was the house of David, so it's, it's his own son he's referring to. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, Zachariah is addressing the baby John. They're in the temple. They're circumcising him. They're naming him. This is a very holy moment in which the child is being presented to the Lord. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. So here is... Um, Zebediah is just simply saying, you know, this is, this is the one who was to come. To give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun, that would be the, the Messiah himself, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And then it says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. I'll talk about that in just a moment. So what I want to show you now is this beautiful uh, church that is, is considered to be the nativity place of John the Baptist. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they had apparently this is how the tradition goes, they had two homes in this area. One was up in the hill, which was the church of the visitation that we what we visited where Mary and Elizabeth met, and the other was down on the on the flat area in town. And in the flat area, this church has been built, and there is in all these places, there's some kind of a grotto or a cave, which is said to be the birthplace of where, where John the Baptist was actually born, and it's supposed to be the site where his home was. Of course, it's very hard, you know, all these hundreds of years later to know. 
but you do go into these places with a degree of, of devotion. And, and now when we think about these, um, uh, these beings, according to um, the things that Master said, um, in, and we think of John the Baptist as Sri Yukteswar, because in the, in the fitness of things, of, of the three wise men being three of our gurus, Master's um, Swamiji statement at the end of his life, that he felt that, it, um, that Master had been Christ in a previous incarnation. And if you accept that, which is the premise that I, I go on when I, when I think about all of this, Jesus being of our line, Jesus appearing to Babaji and asking to restore what was really intended in Jesus' teaching, you think of his guru coming back to help him again, which is Elijah, and then you see the personality of John the Baptist, um, Elijah and Elisha, back again then you think of it being Sri Yukteswar, and you think of that uh, austere, world-renouncing power that was not at all interested in, in harmonizing with the world, but just came really to announce um, that the time had come for the Messiah to be here. If you, if you take those characters and, and put them into the lives of Sri Yukteswar and Master, you see that Sri Yukteswar's primary role in in the incarnation that incarnation was to train master and as master himself said sri yukteswar had very few disciples but by converting me he converted millions and so in the same way you see john the baptist plays this necessary role um, coming as uh, uh, the voice in the wilderness calling to jesus now we're going to get to the point where jesus goes to india and there's some traditions that John the Baptist was also in India when Jesus was, which sort of, you know, wonderfully <laughs> just mixes up the story and makes it all far more interesting. Um, so this part about John the Baptist also living in the wilderness, which they just comment on here. Um, I actually, I'll just, I don't need to keep you in suspense. I don't have to keep the plot so, <laughs> you know, unexplained. But there, the... Um, King Herod became frightened about the possibility that Jesus was going to be more powerful than he, and so he ordered that all the babies under the age of two or the under the age of three should all be slaughtered, the slaughter of the innocents, it's called. When we were looking at the Church of the Visitation and we were looking at the well inside the grotto there, that one of the traditions there is that when the soldiers came um, to murder the children, and John would have been one of those they would have murdered, that the rocks opened and Jesus, um, John and Elizabeth were hidden. The rocks closed and they hid in the mountain until the soldiers had gone away. There's a painting in the church where angels stand between the baby John, his mother Elizabeth, and the soldiers who've come to kill him. And then there's a third story. I mean, who knows, but all of these are marvelous to contemplate. And the third story is that um, Elizabeth and Zachariah released John into the wilderness, even though he was a very young child. They just released him into the wilderness, and he grew up with the animals. And he, he just never lived in normal human society. Elsewhere in the Bible, it says he, lives on, he lived on locust, which makes you think of grasshoppers. You have this picture of this big plate of dead grasshoppers, which is sort of not a very... You know, he lived on locust and honey, is what it says in the Bible. But locust actually was another word for carob, which was uh, something that did grow there. And carob trees, we actually have some right outside the house where I live. They have these long pods, and those pods can be ground into powder, and it's a, it's a very nutritious, it's a very nutritious food. So he lived on locust and honey would be carob and honey, which makes more sense than dead grasshoppers, which is sort of hard to picture. But that tradition, which... Uh, comes out of uh, a little bit out of Edgar Casey and Anne Catherine Emmerich and who knows where else, but it's just a piece of one of those traditions, is that, the, that John, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, having given birth to this child, really had just gave him to God. And so he, 
he lived in animal skins in the wilderness. And when he comes back in, uh, which comes when Jesus is 30, when Jesus returns from India, actually, and comes to be baptized by John. John, by then, is a magnificent figure, but he's a wild man. He's just not, he's not civilized. He didn't grow up in civil society. So at some point in John's life, he went out to the wilderness. When, it, was it, when he was a small child to save him from being killed, who knows? But as a, at a very young age, it seems, John turned his back on the world and went out. You know, John, uh, renouncing all, left his home. He spent long years in solitude, although he was the same age as Christ. So he must have started young to have spent long years in solitude because Jesus was only 30. So um, when, when he came back from India and John was there already as a, as a huge figure. So there's a, there's a tremendous power in the story of John, even though he's, he's only, um, he's, he only plays, he's only there for a small period of time in the story as it's told by the New Testament. And there's all this where his, uh, Jesus in the, in the Old Testament, when Elijah was passing away, Elisha, his disciple, asked for a double measure of his spiritual power. And Elijah said, if you can see me when I transcend, when I leave this body, if you can watch me die and watch me go into the heavenly realms, then I, will, I can transfer that, my power to you. There is this tradition among great spiritual figures, which is the, the passing of the spiritual mantle. And it, it seems to be you know, I, the, the, the master gives his mantle to, you know, to a disciple. Master passed his spiritual mantle to Rajasi. He was his appointed successor. I, I, know, I don't understand it. I have no capacity to understand it. But there is this transference of power. And so Elijah passed that power on to, to Jesus, to Elisha. And then in some of the uh, conversations about it, it says that Elijah was diminished. And so when they were born again as John the Baptist and as Jesus, Elijah was, appeared to be less than his disciple at this point. Swamiji said, you know, a God-realized master can't be less than God-realized. So he spoke of it more that, that John the Baptist played a very um, a small role compared to the role that, that Jesus played. But the guru-disciple relationship both had become equal in spirit, but that relationship is always honored, which when we come later, when Jesus comes to John the Baptist, John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And Jesus says, but it is in the fitness of things that I accept your baptism. And Master explained that on the basis of the guru-disciple relationship, that even though Jesus had uh, become everything that John the Baptist was, Jesus' gratitude to his guru and whatever unique eternal tie that was simply remained. In another context, Swamiji speculated, because Master actually said, just to make it more confusing, that Babaji was his, his true guru and that Babaji sent, and that's how it is in the autobiography, Babaji says to Sri Yukteswar, I'm going to send someone to you for training. Swami sometimes says that he feels that has said that he thought that Sri Yukteswar and Master may have been soulmates in the, you know, in the most supreme divine sense of that, that they were one half of each other in, in that unique divine reality that Master only spoke of once, which is really not about human romance, but is about at the day of manifestation. But their lives were unified in this way. I... I present all of this to you because it's all, it's all so wonderfully rich. When I say these things, I don't feel the need to, to sort of winnow it down, to say, well, if this is true, that must not be true, and if this is true, that must not be true. There's just this wealth of legend, myth, and truth all sort of woven together. And everything, of course, that Master said or that Swamiji said stands first. And then all the rest of it, we, we try to sort of, under, I try to understand how it might fit around it or how in some way it might expand the understanding. For example, 
was John the Baptist released into the wilderness as a child? Well, even if he wasn't, we know, I mean, even if he didn't leave until he was six or 10 or 15, we still have that. What, what he gives us then is this marvelous world renouncing power. And the Bible does say that he lived in the wilderness, and it does say that he lived on locust and honey, and it does say that he dressed in animal skins. So quite clearly, he was just not part of this world. And later on, we'll visit this wonderful cave in a Franciscan monastery in, of course, all these same areas, not far from Jerusalem, where John the Baptist was said to have spent a great deal of time. And uh, it is, like all these places, a truly marvelous place to be. And, and all of these caves, um, partly caves are a natural place for people to live if you don't have a lot of building supplies, and they're much more, much more well-constructed often than ordinary buildings are. But also, of course, um, they're great for meditating it, because of the quiet. Once you, you, know, you go inside a cave, and often they're very quiet. And also they're, um, they're otherworldly. Even, even the small grottos that uh, we're about to see, which is supposedly John's nativity place, the place where he was, the supposedly where he was born, it's just somehow when you have those stone walls, even just, you know, not even uh, hugely deep, but just to be that far in um, the, the strength of the natural world and the enduring power of those stones, um, something, a, a great deal of the om comes through. That's the only way I can say it. Even if you're not hearing it, you can feel it in some way. So let's um, now look at these pictures and about, of the Church of the Nativity of John the Baptist. So this first picture is actually, we're, we're right outside the Church of the Visitation which is up on the hill in this town of Ein Karim. This is like 20 minutes from Jerusalem, but you're really out in the country when you get out here. So first, and that tall spire that you see is actually the church of the Nativity of John the Baptist in the town. And it's a 10, 15 minute walk. We just all walk down the hill. It's a very steep hill coming up to the church of the Visitation. So we go down from there. So let's go to the next picture. And you actually go a little bit through the town, and then you come to this uh, gateway, which leads you into this beautiful courtyard. There's something about that whole church. It feels very, very friendly. It sort of feels like it's, it doesn't feel like a, a place that's set up for tourists. It feels like a place more where, uh, where, where life really happens, where real worship happens. It's beautiful in there. So let's take another step inside, and we'll get into the... This is the exterior of the church. These are these churches, uh, the one we're looking at here, but they're just very plain stone on the outside. There's others that are more beautiful, but these are very sweet this way. Then we go into the interior of it, which is, I've never, I mean, I'm just showing it to you because there it is, but where we actually go is a little to the left of that altar. You go down these stairs, and now we're getting down into the grotto. And... The church was built on this spot because the grotto is there, which was said to be the home of Elizabeth and Zachariah and the place where John the Baptist were, were, was born. Let's take another step into it. And so this is this beautiful altar that is inside. You can see it's a cave above it. And you could sit, and, and you'll see this again when we get to the Nativity Church in Bethlehem, which is, I believe, where we're going next. They have an altar like this so that priests can do mass, and then under it they have a this plate, this uh, star-like shape with a, a circle in the center. You see them in many places throughout Israel, and they they're always marking some really important spot like that. All of this is very accessible. You can, you know, put your head on the on the the stone there and really just feel the power of this. So while we're looking at this picture and feeling the power of John the Baptist coming through. The song I want us to listen to is Children of God, which those of you who know the oratorio, it's this very stirring announcement that God is coming. And I never had thought before who was making that announcement. But when I thought of, of Elijah 
and John the Baptist is the voice crying in the wilderness saying, make way for the Lord, I realize that children of God would be, uh, and maybe that's how Swami intended, I can't ask him now, but, but it, this is John the Baptist announce the, announcing the coming of the Messiah. Now imagine also that we're Essenes, which we were, I believe, that we were Essenes, we've been waiting for the Messiah to come, we know that Elijah is going to come first, and here's the very real possibility that Elijah is with us and he's announcing the coming of the Lord. Imagining, imagine how thrilled we'd be you know, to hear that clarion call coming from the divine source telling us that our days of waiting are done. The Messiah will soon be with us. So in that spirit, let's in, listen to this song. Those of you who know the esoteric of it know that at the end of his life, Swamiji rewrote that song, and so the verses are slightly different, but that was the original version, and the melody, of course, is the same, and the message is the same, so we can stay with it. I didn't even think about it till he started playing it. So be it. Um, there was something else. Well, it doesn't matter. I can't recall. Let's go on with it. Okay, so now the scene is being set. Um, John the Baptist has been born. These two women have, have become uh, pregnant in, you know, miraculous ways with the intercession of the angel. The, the natural term has passed. And now um, first John the Baptist is born just, you know, months before. So these, these two men are the same age and these two men are cousins. And in the context of the Essenes, they all know each other and they're all working together. That's an important part of it because sometimes you, it's sort of presented, the whole story is presented as if these folks just stumbled upon each other. But it was a much more um, powerful uh, collection of energy, magnetism being drawn together in a powerful way so that there were many people supporting the mission of Jesus and, and working together to, to bring this to fruition and, and understanding the miraculous birth of John and so on. There's another, there's another story that Edgar Cayce tells, which I don't, he just presented this as a fact, that Zechariah ended up having, becoming a martyr because he stood by the miraculous nature of John's birth and the more orthodox 
element of Judaism that was not willing to accept um, all that Zacharias was proposing. And then this, again, this has something to do with whether the Essenes were a forbidden community, a secret society, whether they were um, in opposition to the orthodoxy that was considered to be the, the, the mainstream of their religion. But according to the tradition that I read in several places, Zechariah ended up um, being murdered by people who, who were outraged by the claims that he was making for that the angel had come, that this was a miraculous birth, that John had this great destiny, that he was coming in the spirit of Elijah, that they, they wanted to suppress that and, and he wouldn't be suppressed, so they killed him. I don't know if that's true, but it's a pretty grim beginning and, and <clears throat> the precursor, because of course John the Baptist was also killed, and then of course Jesus was killed. So it was a very strange time. It was a very, very Kali Yuga era in which um, having, having the willingness to, to testify to this kind of power was not something that you could do comfortably and safely. And somehow that had to be whatever this drama is one of the aspects of, of, uh, of the idea that Jesus was Master was how many times Master came as a warrior. Um, Master made the comment once, that it, I just love the sort of sweet humanness of this, that, that Lahiri Mahashaya was lucky because his entire incarnation there were no wars. He just lived this peaceful life in Varanasi, whereas Master has to go from India to America and then there's the First World War, then there's the Second World War, then there's the Korean War. And in Master's own life as um, William the Conqueror, and then when he was Ferdinand III, when he was Ferdinand III, his entire adult life was at war. It's just like 26 years of constant war was what his life was about. And he had a little picture, a little statue of the Virgin Mary that he kept on his saddle. He was never injured, but all that time, always fighting like this. So in, in uh, the incarnation of Jesus, um, and when, when, uh, when John was Elijah, as you remember telling the stories, he was fighting against the king and he was fighting against the queen Jezebel and he was fighting against the, the priests of Baal. And in that story, he murdered 450 of them, <laughs> slaughtered the priests. It's just, it's very tempestuous. But that was the personality that Master had. He had the personality of a warrior at all times who, who put his own life on the line to stand up for truth. So if, if the story about um, Zach Zachariah is also true, then it, it began right, you know, right there from the very beginning. And, and part of the drama of the life of Christ that, that plays itself out when he's an adult is that, there, that it is that kind of time and even though the, uh, under the Romans the Jews have a certain amount of freedom, nonetheless they chafed under that because they weren't free. They were, uh, uh, they were other, others had more authority over them than they had over themselves. And there were people who wanted to rebel against that and establish their own kingdom again and not be subservient in these particular ways. So th that, that political unrest was also there was there was arguments among the religious over aspects of their religion and then there was arguments among the whole people against what was the appropriate way to respond to the uh, the occupying authority you know should they rebel should they accept should they cooperate and there were and uh, as we see when we get into the time of Jesus's adulthood and his ministry that was part of what was going on, is he, he called himself a king. And so everybody thought he meant he was going to be a king. He was going to declare himself a king because there had, he was, after all, a descendant of King David, in which the, kings, the, the, the Jewish people had had their own kings, been their own kingdom, and had not been subservient to any conquerors. And so many people expected that Jesus was going to be a political as well as a spiritual leader. And that was just the whole embroiling time of it. So the passing away of Zechariah by violence, if so, would all be part of that. And, of course, as we'll see in a few minutes, 
it starts out with Herod killing all the babies because he, he doesn't want um, anyone to have more power than he. So now let's talk about when Jesus was born. And I'm again reading from the Bible. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was so that they would be able to collect taxes from everybody. They particularly liked to tax the oppressed people. Among the reasons why um, the Jewish people were annoyed is because they were very heavily taxed, and therefore that kept them impoverished and gave them no freedom. And so the, king, the, the Caesar wanted to count them all, and so he could make sure he had the tax rolls complete. You know, 2,000 years ago, everything is just the same. Human nature doesn't change. So everyone had to go to their own hometown um, to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So that's the whole story of how Joseph went back to Bethlehem and it was filled with everybody had, everybody who, for whom that was their point of origin had gone there and there was no room at the inn. There was no place for them, but the, I mean, all the stories grow which were, have been confirmed by saints and confirmed by um, many different sources, that they ended up in what had been a stable, which was again a cave, and we'll see that in just a moment, actually a rather extensive cave. And the manger is where the hay is kept, but of course a manger is also the same shape as a cradle. So when the baby was born, other, other parts of this story are told where, where Anna, um, Mary's mother, and you remember we started at St. Anne's Church back at the beginning, and um, Anna knew um, that, I mean, she'd given birth to Mary, and then Mary had been visited by the angel, and Anna was also, Anna and her father, her husband were all, these were all Essenes, and, and they were all um, part of this uh, movement. And so Anna believed that the child that Mary was going to give birth to was going to be the Messiah. And they were all together, you know, planning for this birth. And, and here Mary is like 14 or 15 years old. Of course, a woman's life started much younger at that time because the span of life was shorter. Um, but uh, um, a woman's adult life started younger, that's what I mean. So it wasn't, it wasn't uncommon for a, a woman to be a mother at such a young age. That was just more, more how society went. But then this decree comes down from the government, and all of a sudden, Joseph and Mary have to go somewhere else. And Anna and her husband had to stay where they were because everybody had to be in their home place. So Mary and Joseph are separated from the family that was going to support them. And Anna is separated from her beloved daughter, at the moment when this great miracle is going to occur. So if you put yourself in it, th that all of this actually happened on the human scale too, you, you sort of see all the, all the tapasya and all the, um, the human disappointment and the necessity to rise to the level of accepting that if this is how God has, has so arranged it, then this must be what the divine will is. But you can also imagine the, um, the disappointment and the effort that was required. So here's Mary. She's in, in the story. She's completely alone. She's not even in an actual house. And she wraps the child in swaddling cloth and places him in a manger. Of course, in the moment, the um, ecstasy of the presence of this child would certainly compensate for everything. But it's not at all the, the human plan. It all just turns into this divine plan instead. So Jesus then is, is born there. And let me just give me a moment. Let me see what I actually have planned here. Yes, okay. So I think what we'll do now 
is let's look at the, the pictures of the Church of the Nativity uh, in Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. This church was built about 300, it says 339 A.D., so they must have an exact statement of it somewhere. It's very old. It was rebuilt a hundred years later, but you can see it's just a, a very plain, strong church. It's also, um, Bethlehem, it, I mean, just in modern politics, Bethlehem is not in Israel. It's in the Palestine territory. So the whole, um, th that all, all that circumstances colors the way the whole, the way it's operated and the whole, the whole uh, I don't know, the whole mood of it, the whole bob of it. It's all very wonderful. If, if you're standing here and you look, you know, all the way across the courtyard to that very small square, that's the actual door. Let's move closer in the picture and I'll show you. See that little door there? And it is as small as it looks. You have to bend over to go in. And that is the entryway to this most holy place in Christianity where you're on your way uh, to the cave, which is under the church which is where it is said that Jesus was born. Now, Master said almost every place is authentic, and I think this one is. I certainly, it just, it has a tremendous power. And St. Helen, who I mentioned earlier, was the mother of the um, Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, who converted his whole country um, to Christianity. And St. Helen um, was found the true cross. I talked about that earlier, and she... This place was traditional when she got there. It was like it had been preserved all this time, and she just arranged to have the, the church built over it. So let's go through the small door. Some say the small door was there for the humility of the pilgrims. Others say it was so that the enemies of Christianity couldn't ride their horses into the church and desecrate the church. I'm not sure. Now, inside this church... In, in, when you go to Israel just as a, a, a tourist fact and also a pilgrim fast, fact, some of the churches are Roman Catholic and some of them are Greek Orthodox and some of them are Russian Orthodox. And the decor of the Greek or Russian Orthodox, I believe this is Greek or Orthodox, is quite different than the Catholic. This is a very old church and they're always trying to preserve it. It's a world heritage site um, and all of those old columns Okay, let's um, go closer just to look at the old columns that are here. And the, the altar's in the center, and to the right of the columns is a long corridor. You go, the, the cave where Jesus was born is under the altar. So you have to walk to the back, and then you have to go down steps, and then you're actually going under the altar is the place where, they, um, where, where Jesus was born. If, you, if the next picture, you just look up on the wall, they're, they're working to restore this, and this is what's left of mosa the mosaics that were in there. So at one time, of course, it was much more elegantly appointed, but, but uh, time has wreaked havoc on all of this. And there's another picture of the altar as it is now. Just this is what, whenever you see this, you know that you're in the Greek Orthodox churches. I, I don't know the difference between the Greek and the Russian, but you're in one or the other. Okay, then we're going to go around to walk to the right side. And this is the entry to the cave, which is under the altar. That's exactly where we're walking. And you have all these icons all around and fabric over things. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to switch us in just a moment with the pictures. Because the, the, the place where Jesus was said to have been born, this cave, it's not particularly large. It's, it's the, large of, the size of a um, a medium-sized living room, I would say. And I don't have pictures that actually show you how big it is. Everything is all at one end. The altar where um, Jesus was born and then the manger where the baby was put. They're, they're just sort of right there in the corner. But the cave itself is much larger. And at a certain point, it was walled, it was cut in half and it was walled in half. And when you go around and go into another cathedral, you walk into what is actually the same cave. Um, and so I, and, and it looks more like a cave. So why don't we go to the next picture and I'll just show you. So now, as just as it happens, the Saint Jerome lived for 30 years in this cave and he translated the Bible into Latin. And so it actually has a magnificent vibration, but I'm only really showing it to you 
So you can just see what the cave is. So we have to, we should have three more pictures of the of this cave. Let's see if we do. So this is just other parts of the cave. You can see it's been built up, but you can still see sort of what it might have been like. And that is more like what Jesus and Mary and Joseph were, were coming into. There's another one. Let's see the next one. Okay, this just happens to be where St. Jerome is buried. But it's just to get a feel for the cave. So now let's go back to, an, to the entry into the Nativity Cave. There it is again. These are the same stairs going under the altar just from the other side. So then let's go into that cave. And so those are the stairs that you come down. And on the left side there, and all decorated like that, is the, is the birth spot of Jesus. And then there's the, the, the altar for the Mass. And where the woman is kneeling on the ground there is the, the birth spot. And then behind her, where you see that little column, let's go to the next uh, picture. Um, now the birth spot is to the left, and this little area here is the manger where the baby was put. So you can I imagine it now looking like St. Jerome's cave without all of the fabric and everything. That is just a stone place, and Mary and, and Joseph were on one side, and then the manger was over here, and they, they came and uh, put the baby into the manger. Okay, then let's go back. We're going to go back, and this is just another season of the birthplace, and you can see it better. And of course, all the art and so on. All of that fabric is just hanging over just bare rock, because that's all that's there. And underneath, and then let's go real close underneath. So this is where every pilgrim who comes, you come down the stair, and you go over to the, the manger place, and then you come over here, and then you crawl under the table, and you uh, can put your head right on that spot. It's a 14-point star. And the tradition is, as they say, that and it, 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 in numerically, in Hebrew, the name David becomes the number 14. And then there's also that, you know, there were 14 generations three times between David and the birth of Jesus. So it was three times 14 generations. I have no idea, but you see this specific shape with the circle in the middle repeatedly. Now I'm going to assume Master was here. You should know that Master came here when he came to Israel. He went to all these places and was thrilled by them. And so you have to imagine that Master was also here. And it's this, uh, undoubtedly it was very similar to the way it is now. And Master stood on this spot communed with the Spirit of Christ, visiting his own birthplace, it's sort of hard to say. But I, I will say from experience, unfortunately, usually this place is very crowded, but it's magnificent. And when we, we have managed on some occasions to be able to go into the room, that the, the, the rest of the cave, which is in front of this, and um, the power and the presence is, is really extraordinary. So while we're attuning ourselves to this very spot where Jesus was born. Let's listen to this song from the Oratorio, which of course is Christ Has Come.
Oh my. <laughs> okay. Um, when, I, when I hear that, of course, that beautiful song, many of you are familiar with the oratorio and its origin, and I, I wrote a lot of it into the light bearer. Um, when Swamiji went to Israel with Rosanna, I, I was just trying to look it up. It's eight, 1983 or 84. I'm not certain. I can't remember right at the moment. And uh, when he was back in Italy after that trip, and then the melodies began to come to him, just he woke up. He woke up one morning with melodies related to the places he'd visited on pilgrimage. And then he thought what would happen if he deliberately tuned in and tried to receive melodies, because the first ones came unbidden. And uh, he said before he got out of bed, he'd had 21 melodies had come to him. And which became the oratorio. So he was very uh, elated about the, the possibility of being able to translate the experience of being in the Holy Land into music. Um, Swami said many things about it in, in time, but he said when he wrote the oratorio, it was the first time he wrote music primarily to convey a specific vibration, was the way he put it. And it was a, a changing in his apparently in his writing of music. And he was so thrilled by this, and he started working on the oratorio, and he worked continuously for the next four months to finish it. But I so, I, I remember vividly, he, we, we had the, we still had the house in San Francisco. Ananda had a, an ashram house in San Francisco at that time, the big house on Broadway that uh, Jyotish and Devi established for Ananda in 1979. And uh, Swami came back from the trip, and we, a group of us went to meet him at the airport. And then we came back to the house, and we went up to his... He had this very large room, and there was a group of a dozen or so of, of us sitting there with Swamiji. And he was, he was so thrilled to share with us this oratorio because he knew it was going to be magnificent, and it was going to communicate... Uh, 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 the master's the, the the spirit of what master wanted to express in the teachings of Christ. It was going to come across in this music, and Swami at that time was engaged with the Rosanna's uh, Pecky group, and he saw them as a, a way because they were charismatic Catholics. He thought he saw that as a way to bring master's teachings into the churches. So we were all sitting in the circle, and Swami gets out this little keyboard. It was a very small one that he used for travel. It was, I mean, maybe you know, one or two octaves at the most. Just a very small thing. And he sat there, and he played for us all the melodies. And the melodies were all a single note played on this exceedingly dinky little thing so that the sound quality was not great. The tone was true, but it was not great. And he would play the basic melody line or a little bit of the song. And... Uh, I'm not the most gifted musician, so it, I might not have been the the best person, but it was not as impressive as Swami's enthusiasm. <laughs> Swami's enthusiasm was magnificent, <laughs> and the impression that his little plink, 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 plink made on us, it, a lot of the power was in, lost in the translation. But we all knew well enough that we needed to be totally enthusiastic, because that was not the moment we'd all learned from bitter experience. That was not the moment in Swami's creative process to bring in any note of questioning. It was just the time to say, wow, wow, Swami, amazing. And it was funny because later when he actually had the whole oratorio together, then it was safe then to say it. We, we told him just how, how um, little of what the oratorio became was communicated to most of the people in the room. And then Swami laughed too because he said, you know, he would hit those single notes and he heard the whole thing. He heard the harmonies, he heard the orchestration, he, and he felt the power of it. And so we did feel that with him. We did feel tremendously uplifted, just not necessarily because of the notes he was hitting. But it was also a, a, just a wonderful story of Swami's creative flow. For him, it was already there. And for him, it was already there, even in what he was sharing with us. And it was just because his enthusiasm spills over that he, he had to offer all that to us. And so it, it became 
it became that wonderful piece of music among many, many others, because he, he had that in him. Swami actually, just to speak of it, he said, uh, the inspiration I received from these pilgrimage sites, he said, was complete in itself. He said, it, I, I, it, it didn't become larger for my expressing it, his own inspiration. It was just interesting. In other words, he didn't express it for his own sake. It was already there. But he expressed it for the, for the opportunity he saw to really be able to serve the world, which, of course, he has beautifully with this. It was the oratorio that really brought um, Christ into Ananda life in a self-realization way. We, even before then, we were always celebrating Christmas and Easter in the way that Master had done with great um, devotion. But when Swami put that inspiration into music and then we could absorb it through the music, it was like we were able to come back to the experience of Christ uh, with our own vibration and not just be sort of caught up in what the churches had done. So it was a very important part of Ananda's um, spiritual development, the, the creation of that. And of course, going through Israel with Swamiji's music um, really attuned it us to it in exactly the right way. So now, as we all know, because we all know this story, after Christ was born, um, the angels were there, um, but the angels then went to tell the shepherds, you know, that this really glorious thing had happened. So we read in the New Testament, it says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Oh, just a moment. <clears throat> yes, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. We have just this, it's so touching in so many ways. We have the Messiah being born, and then the angels go, and the first people they tell are the shepherds. And that's how the story is told, so let us assume it's how it happened. So then the shepherds come to visit the baby. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So now we'll go to what's called, appropriately, the shepherd's field which is a place in Bethlehem, not very far from the Nativity Church. So let's go to there. Okay, so um, this is a fairly open area, not very highly developed. There is a, a small chapel there, which we'll come to in a moment, which is really beautiful. At a certain point, some, some centuries ago, the Franciscans were given by, the, by, I guess, the Vatican, the Franciscans were given custody of the Holy Land. 
So many of the holy spots are Franciscan monasteries, and the influence of the of Francis then is um, strong there in ways that are some things we'll talk about when we get a little farther in. But it's always so that's what that means: the shepherd's field, Franciscan custody of the Holy Land. All right, let's go into the next step in glory in excelsis Deo. This is the archway between those two pillars where you see the sign. So you walk into the shepherd's field through this beautiful archway of the angels crying out in joy that Jesus was born. So let's go further. And surprise, surprise, there's a cave. (laughs) And this is just the little um, facade that's built over it and they've protected it with cement. And we go inside this cave and this is a cave where the shepherds were staying. It has a wonderful vibration. It's very simple inside. Everywhere there's a place where the Catholics can do Mass. But again, you sort of get, you, you go into these places where you're really under um, these stone rocks. It's, there's two caves here, but there's only one that I could find any photographs for. So we're just going to, let's see another view. It's just the other side of the cave. We just turn it backwards. So we were able to sit in here, and you can, because of the stone, you can sort of feel the energy of what it must have been like when there was nothing else there and it was just very plain. Now there's also a beautiful chapel here on this place and it's it's not very large. It has wonderful acoustics. It's round inside. There was an Italian architect who I believe he was commissioned by the Franciscans and he built five different churches in the Holy Land and they're all very, very nicely done. So let's go inside of this one has this, this is the dome that you could see from the outside. You can see it's not that large a chapel when you go in it. And then we'll see this interior shot. It's circular. And um, they have three beautiful paintings. Well, first we'll look at the first one here, which is, this is the shepherds who are watching their flocks by night, (laughs) although it looks rather like the daytime there. (laughs) <laughs> and you see that one of the shepherds is already dancing for joy because he must know what's coming. And again, you you often see in the art, especially in this man's churches, you know, there's just there's a, a, a real sweetness to the way they convey it. And then the next picture is when the angels come to visit the shepherds. So while we look at this picture, let's hear the song from the oratorio, which is quite simply "Shepherds Awake." When he in Bethlehem Jesus was born, the angels did herald the news to shepherds who slept upon a wintry field. They sang awake in the picture that's shown now. Now this is just a beautiful nativity with the shepherds there visiting and Mary and the animals, the whole beautiful story. So while we enjoy this picture, let's listen to Swami's wonderful song, The Christ Child's Asleep.
Jesus came on earth to offer second birth to all who would the blessing receive. The inner peace he brings can lift us on soul wings to soar in light and heaven perceive. and pains, our losses, our gains, have kept us long bound, the ropes of yearning hemmed us round, we dreamed of imposing on deserts and flower gardens of beauty, verdant veils of
Jesus has been born and he's resting in the manger. And the next part of the birth story, you can put my face on again. Um, The next part of the birth story is, of course, the three kings, the three wise men who come to visit Jesus. Now, it's traditional now that we just sort of fold the three wise men into the into the nativity scene. But in, in various ways, it's more likely that they actually came later, even a couple of years later, it's not known. Um, Master said that the three wise men were, were Lahiri Mahashaya, Babaji, and Sri Yukteswar. And that when Jesus came of age at the age of 14 and left Israel and went to India, he was he went back to see his own masters in the land of their birth. There's also a lot of traditions from Casey and others that the Essenes actually had strong connections with India, that it was not at all that the worlds were separated, that the Essenes were a remnant of of um, an ancient brotherhood of wise. Uh, For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and watch carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, the wise men went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, and it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but then having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. They intuitively know that Herod did not want to come and worship the child, but he wanted to come and eliminate him for the threat he might represent. So what we're going to share now, because there's no real location for the wise men except the a beautiful nativity scene we've already seen. But the wise men have naturally been the subject of an enormous amount of art. So I've collected more than a dozen or so pictures, uh, different paintings of of the kings bowing to the child. They'll go by um, somewhat quickly, but for those of you, you can go back and look at the recording. Because I, I really recommend it. There's some just beautiful detail in these pictures of these great kings bending over you know, to the little baby and humbling themselves in front of the child and touching his feet and having the, the, the child reach out and touch the head of the kings. And the spirit of it is, uh, well, it, it's all about us. You know, it's not really about them and it's not really about the past. It's really about the, the descent of spirit into this world. It's about the, the never-ending love of God that is always listening to our prayers and is always ready to respond to whatever it is that we need. Um, Just a moment of all things. Um, Is always ready to respond to our need. And even um, the most grand among us, you know, becomes humble in the face of the the presence and the power of God. So, of course, Swamiji has written this beautiful song called The Three Wise Men, and we'll um, watch through the beautiful paintings, and then toward the end we'll get to see the three wise men as Master presented them to us. Then three wise men came from afar, guided by the heavenly star, Christ the light of God had descended, at receiving him all might be saved. Thus the promise of God was maintained, Thus, all 
true souls were called to the light. That their darkness be lifted, that their hearts be made whole. When Mary's babe smiled, he conveyed truth and grace. That their darkness be lifted, that their hearts be made whole. When Mary's babe smiled, he conveyed truth and grace. Then three wise men came from, from afar, guided by the heavenly star. Many came from afar, guided by the heavenly star. Christ the light of God had descended. Christ the light of God had come, that receiving him, that receiving him, all might be saved, all might be saved. Three wise men came, guided by a star, to do honor and welcome the Christ born on earth. Three wise men came, guided by a star, to do honor and welcome the Christ born on earth. Isn't that wonderful? That's um, as far as we're going to go this evening. So this is the beginning of December, and so now all through this month we've now had the descent of the avatar into the world. We've seen the manger and the, the very place in that cave in Bethlehem where Jesus chose to um, make his entrance into this world, where the Mother of God, the beautiful Mary, was there with him in the saintly Joseph, blessed by the angels. Then, of course, the shepherds were, were, were awoken from their night's sleep, and the angels declared that Jesus was there, and the kings came and prostrated themselves before him. It's so exquisite, all of it. So we're going to end this evening with one last song from the oratorio, which is, of course, the song that Swami wrote to celebrate this, it's called, quite simply, Sing Out With Joy. And that'll be the end of our evening tonight. Sing out, sing out with joy, God's light has descended. Sing out, sing out with joy, all our 